let's just uh, finish looking at this introductory paragraph and it will be uh, leading us into some of the uh, most decisive evidence uh, for determining the starting point of the 70 weeks. It turns out in analyzing the different interpretations, but that's a key question, just where did the 70 weeks start? And if you can determine that properly, you've already el eliminated the dispensationalist point of view, and you get some uh, rather clear evidence uh, that uh, the 70 weeks of the prophecy begin right here at, at this point that we are dealing with, uh, where, where Daniel is uh, praying for uh, the mountain of the temple of, of the Lord. So yet I was praying in uh, speaking in prayer, and the man Gabriel might have seen the vision at the first being made to fly quickly reached me at the time of the evening ablation. Now notice verse 22. Why Yavin, why Yedabir? So he instructed me and he spoke with me. And he said, okay, Daniel, now I have come to instruct you with understanding. It's sort of piling up of uh, words here about uh, giving him, uh, illuminating the, the, the message. Verse 23, at the very beginning of your prayers. Now, Daniel's uh, been engaged in, in this, and the, the details of his prayer, if you read through it, is a, a recitation in, in covenantal language of the way in, in which uh, Israel has been breaking the covenant and the uh, fall is, uh, is properly coming to them as their just desserts. And at the very beginning of his uh, supplications, now notice the expression, uh, Yatsa Davar. Hmm? The word went out. It, it's the word of response. What what Daniel's praying for? Uh, it, it turns out that the the opening verses of of chapter uh, nine that we'll go back to is he's been studying in the prophecies of Jeremiah uh, that at the end of seventy years there there would be a, a restoration, and uh, that's the immediate occasion that uh, that triggers his prayer and is a sort of the basis that uh, he appeals to uh, for God to act because God in uh, these prophecies of Jeremiah 25 and 29 has actually promised that uh, and that there would be such a restoration. So uh, Daniel is armed with these promises of God. He's, he's pleading these particular uh, promises and now Gabriel comes and says uh, that as soon as you began to, to pray for this restoration for, for God to, to in, in effect to uh, issue from his heavenly council a de decree that Israel should the return and so on. And when, when you, uh, right when you began to pray, Daniel, already God heard you, and the answer went forth. The decree of God uh, to uh, effect this restoration uh, already went forth. Uh, that's uh, the, the force we're going to see here of, of this Yatsad Davar. God issues uh, his Davar uh, that Israel should uh, return. And so at the very beginning of your prayers, the decree went forth. And Gabriel goes on, and I now have come, lehagid, if you'll in a concert from Nagad, to tell you, to inform you. And why? Because the, the, sort of parenthetically, it is indicated that hamudotata, uh, and literally, you are delights. Huh? And in the context of prayer, I, I take it that the particular idea is that Daniel's prayer finds acceptance with the Lord, and the Lord is uh, about to respond favorably to it. Now, I have come to tell you, for the, the Lord has heard your prayer and accepted you, and, and here comes the, uh, the response. So, understand the davar. All right, now here's the davar again. The decree already went forth. I've come to explain it, 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 it to you, and now notice that in a parallelism, we, I have come to explain the Davar to you, he goes on to say, therefore, understand, so he had the, the double use of the same verb, being, uh, understand the Davar, yes, uh, understand, now it's called the, the vision, it's the vision of the 70 weeks that Daniel's, uh, that, that Gabriel's uh, about to present him with, and so you now have the the vision equals the davar, so the decree has already gone forth. The, 
decree is one that's uh, embedded in the, 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 the vision, the vision of the 70 weeks. And uh, the, the effect of it is, therefore, already that the 70 weeks have begun. Uh, the, the vision of the 70 weeks has begun because of the <coughs> decree, which is the vision, huh? the, is the trigger of the vision, which is the heart of the vision, has already gone forth. And then further supporting this, and we'll jump right down to it right away, is in verse 25, which is part of the, the prophecy itself. In verse 24, uh, there's a six-fold statement of purpose. What is it that the, the 70 weeks will accomplish? And there are six things we'll be uh, looking at more closely. And then in verse 25, it, it starts to divide the 70 weeks into parts, into seven weeks and 62 weeks and one week. And so he says uh, now in verse 25, <coughs> know and understand that min moza davar. Uh, here you get obviously a reflection of Yatsar Davar. Yet there it was, the decree has already gone forth. Now, here he's speaking about the beginning of the 70 weeks, and he describes it as the going forth of the decree. And uh, so, here is just a set of uh, verses. I don't see how uh, commentators uh, avoid the obvious. It's, it's just so plain that that's what's going on. Uh, that the, the 70 weeks have begun. The vision of the 70 weeks is underway. It, it began while Daniel was still praying, and uh, this is the year 539. So um, now let's just back off. Uh, uh, well, maybe I'll just finish the introductory. Uh, and I am come to make you known that because you're a poet, and uh, or that that was the, that was the end of, of the introductory uh, section. Okay. Now we. We've made us present this key evidence already for the starting point, but now let's try to get an overview of uh, the, the, the several views that we're dealing with here. And uh, to do that, we'll set up a series of dates across the top of the board and uh, then try to show in the form of a little chart how the more critical commentators would, would uh, allot the 70 weeks and then also how uh, a typological covenantal covenant theology point of view would do it. And I present my own view, uh, E.J. E. Young's uh, view. E.J. Young has a good commentary on, uh, on, on Daniel. And, and then uh, a third variety of this type of view is the one presented in the Kyle and Dalit series uh, uh, by Kyle. By the way, when you're, you're uh, citing in, uh, in footnotes references to the Kyle and Dalit uh, uh, series, uh, and note who the particular author of the particular book is, and then don't attribute the, everything to Kyle and Daly, so if, uh, attribute it to the right one. And, and it was Daniel uh, Kyle that did the one on, on, on Daniel, K E I L K. And uh, so he has a, a distinctive variety of, of our type of view, and then <coughs> the dispensationalist view. Now, uh, the, the first of these dates we'll talk about is the 605. And uh, what date is that? Well, that corresponds to the opening verse in Daniel. Mm -hmm. In the year 605 is uh, where Nebuchadnezzar comes and takes Daniel and some of the others into uh, captivity. It's not the, the final fall of the city uh, yet. It's not the, the complete uh, uh, exile, but it is, it is the, the beginning of it. And it's an episode that is very much neglected in, in, in some historical reconstructions of, uh, of the matter. As a matter of fact, I think I did know when we were talking about the date and authorship how some would point to Daniel 1.1 1, 1 as one of the historical inaccuracies in, in its uh, uh, version of the 6th century B.C. Uh, so 605 then, is, is that an episode? And then 587 would be what? 587? Yeah, that, now that, that is the fall of, of Jerusalem. Now, 539 8, this is the, the, what we've just been talking about. Uh, 605 is Daniel 1, verse 1. 539 is Daniel 9, verse 1. All right. uh, Daniel's prayer and, and uh, Gabriel's uh, prophecy uh, are dated to this year, which is the first year of, of Cyrus. 
who is derives the meat. All right. Now the next date you might not uh, right away catch the significance of. Uh, it's, it's listed in the interest of, uh, of, of showing the dispensationalist view. Uh, we are going to be arguing, of course, that the <coughs> starting point of the 70 weeks is right there. Dispensationalists are not able to accept that obvious starting point because they are literalists. And the 70 weeks of years, the 490 years, uh, if one starts from 587, would not get you up to Christ, and the dispensationalists are, are at least, uh, you know, acknowledging that this is a messianic prophecy, and, and you have to get that far. And so if you're going to get up to Christ, even before the, their parenthesis, uh, you can't start at 539. So they have to find some other point, some other decree. We've just been talking about a decree that went forth when, uh, when Daniel first began to pray. And, and uh, that decree there, obviously, is the heavenly decree itself, the original. But God's decree comes to expression on earth in the, the decree of Cyrus that we'll be uh, also uh, looking at. And uh, so is it the decree of Cyrus that, that triggers the 70 weeks, or, or is it a later one? Dispensationalists say it's this later one, and the references in Nehemiah 2 to a decree issued by our exerces having to do with with uh, the, the implementing of, of the return and so on later on. It didn't all happen overnight, it was a process, and so there was a, a decree at that uh, later point. Dispensationalists will be, be arguing, well, it can't be Cyrus, because Cyrus didn't have anything to do with the restoration of the city, only the, the temple. Well, we'll be checking that out. But they say this one fits uh, better, the whole picture of the restoration of the city and the temple. Now you can very well see that given the date of <coughs> 445 BC and 490 years will get you up uh, to the Messiah. And in some of their uh, uh, claims, at least they claim, uh, that it, it works out right, right perfectly to the day of the triumphal entry. Well, uh, that, that's their claim. Now the next number is just a round number. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the you know, the text uh, divides the 70 into seven weeks, 62 and one. And uh, the way it's gonna work out is that first period of seven weeks or 49 years, that first Jubilee period, uh, will witness the restoration of the Old Testament temple. Within the first seven weeks, Daniel's immediate concern will be answered. Mm -hmm. He was praying about the mountain of God's temple. It was in ruins. <coughs> And uh, all right, the decree's already gone forth to do something about that. And within the space of, of seven weeks uh, of years, within one jubilee period, symbolically, uh, this will be taken care of. And so what we're looking for now is just some round number that we can point to as marking the end of, of the restoration uh, of, of uh, the old order. Obviously, the rest period of restoration doesn't go all the way up to Christ. It, it ends somewhere uh, along the line. And this is just a, a, a round number that would take you to about the end of the ministry of Ezra and Nehemiah and, and so on. It's conceivable maybe that uh, the, the cutoff point is uh, would, would take you through the um, whole period of the Persian Empire up to the rise of the Greek Empire in the fourth century, but uh, whatever. Uh, for us, it's, it's just a, a, a general ending point for the period of restoration. Whereas, of course, uh, for a, a dispensationalist, they're working very literally, and so they are, they are taking the uh, seven weeks, the 49 uh, years, quite literally, and so from uh, Artaxerxes, that they would want to be very precise about the, 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 the cutoff point of the first seven weeks, uh, as, as being 49 years later, which would be, what, somewhere in, into 390-something. Now, the next number, 165 uh, we put on uh, because we also want to take account along with the dispensationalist and typological views of the critical view and on, on the, the critical view as you can well imagine uh, we, we discussed their view of the four empires and, and saw how they want to end everything uh, in the second century BC where they date the origin of the book of Daniel and so that the events of Antiochus Epiphanes and so on in the second century BC 
uh, that's where things should end, and that's also then where they want to end the prophecy of the 70 weeks, as well as the prophecies in Daniel 2 and 7 of the four world kingdoms. And uh, so that date is going to uh, figure as the, the date uh, of, uh, of uh, the, the end of the period of persecution under the Titus uh, Epiphanes 1, 165. Well then, brings us up to our Lord, first advent. And also 70 AD. Now we've got to keep our 70s straight here. We're talking about 70 weeks, the prophecy of the 70 weeks of years. Now we're talking here about 70, the particular date, 70 AD, okay? And, uh, well, we're getting a little crowded here, especially if you wanted to get some variety of millennial views in. But let's just settle for the moment here for Antichrist and parousia, which is the same as consummation, so let's call it consummation. Since between the parousia and the consummation there is no millennium, since the premillennial view is wrong, uh, the, the, the parousia is the consummation. Of course, if you, you are bound to be a premillennialist, you, you want to tuck something in between the parousia and you need a more complicated and a chart, it's not only, it's wrong, of course, as well as more complicated, but we'll stick with this one. All right. Now then, criti critical views. And uh, just one out of, I mean, there's a variety of different ways in which they, they handle the thought, and, and the critics uh, are, are uh, literalists, like the dispensationalists, and, and, and to one end, of, and uh, the liberal contingent on the other end, uh, uh, agree in being literalists. And they want this thing uh, all to work out in terms of 490 literal years, somehow or other. And one way they've done it, uh, and which illustrates the, the, their problems with making this thing work, is uh, to say that the first seven weeks, mm -hmm. seven weeks, 62 and one, the first seven weeks, the first 49 years, some of them start with 587, and uh, take us down, well, from the destruction of Jerusalem uh, to the decree of Cyrus to return, uh, they, they tried to work out as, uh, as uh, about 49 uh, years, and uh, that's the first seven. Then, strangely, to take care of the rest of the 490 years, uh, the, some of them then come back, instead of the, the eighth week being in continuation with the first seven, it starts uh, uh, here, uh, and the 62 weeks take you up to uh, about the time of the uh, persecution uh, under Titus Epiphanes, which lasts something short of seven years, and uh, before Jerusalem then is, uh, is delivered under the Maccabees and all. And so then this would be the 70th week, this weeks one through seven, this would be weeks eight through 62. So. Uh, you know, there, there are some very contrived things going on there to break up the sequence of uh, one through seven with uh, the rest and, and so on. Uh, but that, that's the way they, they do it. Now then, uh, typological view, three varieties. The, the first one will be uh, my own, and we've already been arguing, you see, that this is the key point, the starting point of the 70 weeks. Yeah, it's 539. You just can't avoid it, but that's uh, what already the introductory paragraph tells us, and there's a lot more evidence we'll be looking at. Uh, so we started there, 539, and right away we too, of course, recognize that it, uh, we have to come up to Christ. He, he is in, in, in the picture before it's over. <coughs> and that is already more than 490 years, and so clearly we can't be literalists. Clearly we have to be uh, treat this symbolically, and, and the symbolism of it is uh, very evident. Uh, 70 weeks divided into 7 plus 62 and 1. The first 7 is 49 years. 49 years is a jubilee. 490 is 10 jubilees. This is sabbatical symbolism, more precisely, it's jubilee symbolism. Jubilee symbolism that has to do with, with our, the basic ideas of redemption and deliverance and restoration and vengeance and so on. Uh, which is precisely what the prophecy is all about. And, and so a, a jubilee framework uh, 
for for this is uh, very meaningful, and uh, that's what we're dealing with. And so the way it turns out is that uh, one jubilee period. first seven weeks is set aside as the answer to the Old Testament situation. As far as the typological kingdom and mountain and temple are concerned, there will be a restoration. Daniel's prayers will be answered. God uh, is already busy answering the prayer. And in what is one jubilee period, uh, that will be accomplished. And so, as I say, this is a a, a, a round number for, for where the work of restoration uh, terminated. We can say something like 400. But then 490 years equals 10 jubilee periods. And so one jubilee period to affect the restoration of the Old Testament order, 10 jubilees to bring it to pass for the ultimate anti-typical temple of God, which is the ultimate thing in view in, in the 70 weeks. And uh, that, however, then divided into 8 and 62. That 25th verse says, from the going forth of the decree to restore and so forth will be seven weeks and 60 and two weeks. From the going forth of the decree unto Messiah, the Prince, Mashiach, Nagi, there will be seven weeks and that's seven weeks, 8 through 69. Uh, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks up to Messiah and more specifically, I think we'll see that the evidence suggests that it's not just up to the incarnation, but it's uh, really up to the cross. And that it is the cross, that is to say that it is the, the inauguration, the ratification of the new covenant uh, that <coughs> marks the beginning of the 70th week. And so the 70th week, which fills out then the 490 years, which fills out the 10 jubilees, ushers in the eternal jubilee uh, and uh, the consummation. So in, in effect, I would think of the 70th week as, uh, as uh, bringing us right into the, the consummation stage of, of things. Uh, I wrote an article called The Covenant of the 70th Week, which appeared in, where did it appear? It appeared, I guess, in the press room. Uh, uh, for uh, O.T. Alice, which was edited by John Skilton, which was called, what was it, The Law and the Prophets, I guess was the name of that, and it should be on the, on, uh, the reserve shelf, and the covenant of the, the 70th week. It was a, a, a especially a, a study of, of this, this final phase of things, <coughs> and I, I will make some use of that article along uh, the way. But, but that would be... Uh, my understanding of it. Now the 70th week, of course, is further divided. It says, uh, in the midst of that week, mm -hmm. first it has declared that Messiah uh, will, in, the, in the, the course of the 70th week, he will purpose here, he will confirm, he will bring to pass, he will make the covenant to prevail. Then it says that well, Hatsi, in, in the midst of the, that week, in the midst of the 70th week, something happens. <coughs> Namely, uh, he destroys the old city. So in the course of the 70th week, the New Covenant age, from the cross on, Christ accomplishes the fulfillment of all of the, the blessings ever promised in the, in the Abrahamic promises of the kingdom. He, he will bring to pass uh, that uh, kingdom of, of grace and glory. And yet in the midst of that week, uh, he will deal decisively and finally with the Old Covenant order because there is an overlap. Huh? So that the old continues after the, the new has begun. Huh? And in 70 AD, the old is terminated. So in that 70th week, Christ in the midst of it, in set, it which turns out to be then 70 AD, uh, brings an end to the old Israel. Well, that's the, the <coughs> Now, you shouldn't be looking for some proportionate correspondence between uh, seven weeks here and the number of years involved are, are uh, half of the, you know, look at uh, something about 2,000 years already here uh, in the second half of the 70th week. So there's no proportion in this. It's all symbolic. And so 70 AD is... Uh, is uh, identified as the middle of this 70th week. Well, now that, that's the structure we'll be working with. 
And uh, now the next one would be E.J. Young's, which is, is very much the same, except that uh, uh, I don't think he, he does justice to this thought that's in the midst of the 70th week that uh, the Old Testament order ends and that that's a, a 70 AD. And uh, he uh, seems to end the, uh, the 70th week uh, somewhere here instead of uh, uh, seeing that in terms of the jubilee symbolism that you, you've come to the ultimate jubilee, you've come to the, the, the trumpeting of the, the final consummation by the, the, the angels and so on. And so he terminates it somewhere along here, but uh, otherwise it's rather much the same. But now, Kyle's view <coughs> is quite distinctive. And uh, he starts, of course, at the right point. But here it's a question of the punctuation in that 25th verse. Now, I punctuated it a moment ago by saying, from the going forth of the decree to restore the city unto Messiah the Prince is seven weeks and 62 weeks, I, I joined them together. Kyle and, and uh, others have done this, put a strong punctuation after the seven weeks. So they say that from the going forth of the decree, <coughs> from the going forth of the decree, unto Mashiach the Gid, unto Messiah the Prince, there are seven weeks. Now if you punctuate it that way, then the 62 weeks mentioned in verse 25 go into the post-Messianic age, into the New Covenant age. And so for him, weeks 8 through 69, those 62 weeks, are describing church history. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, on our understanding of it, they were very much describing Old Testament history up to Christ. On Kyle's view, those 62 weeks are a description of the development of the church under the symbolism of the restoration of, of the temple. And then the 70th week, he would interpret in terms of a, a climax of, of, uh, of persecution and so on for the church before the consummation. Now, the fact that there is such a climax is fine. Hmm? Uh, on my understanding of it, it's just that the 70 weeks passage doesn't happen to deal with it. Uh, other passages definitely do. Uh, this one doesn't, but, but on Kyle's view, uh, that, that crisis is itself then equated with the, the actual 70th uh, week. Uh, there's a formal point of contact we'll recognize with the dispensationalists, so uh, uh, which is the last one we'll speak of here tonight. So the dispensationalist view, their starting point, as we said, if they can't accept the correct starting point because they are literalists. And 490 years won't get you from 539 up to Christ, let alone anything beyond that. And so they can't start there. And as we said, therefore, they, they select this decree of Nehemiah 2 of our searches as the starting point. And then from there on, uh, The restoration takes place in about 49 years, all right. Then the 62 weeks. Take this up to, not quite up to the cross, because they say it ends at the triumphal entry. And so up to the triumphal entry of Jesus, terminates the first 69 weeks. And of course, right here, becomes the, the very distinctive and, and totally un unwarranted uh, notion of the dispensationalist that there is now a, a break in the continuity of the, of, uh, the, the 70 weeks. So, you know, not, not quite as, uh, or maybe it is, uh, uh, as contrived as the, the critical view that <laughs> wouldn't put the eighth week after the seventh, uh, but certainly very contrived is the notion now that you have a, an interruption, the familiar language they used of the prophetic clock stops ticking at, at this point and uh, doesn't start ticking and therefore the 70 weeks don't continue again until 
the church has been raptured out of the world, if they uh, understand it, and, uh, and things return to the Old Testament stage of things and God's concerned with Israel and Canaan and, and all of that, which then is described in terms of the 70th week. And now here, you know, there's the class of kind of just for and then there are all of the things that have happened uh, since where you have the pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, uh, all kinds of varieties of this thing. But just in its classical form, uh, they would see then the 70 uh, uh, the, the events at the, after the, this, the rapture of the church out, out of the world as involving a, a Satan making a, a covenant um, we'll be looking at, especially at the language then in verse 27, see how unjustified this, this uh, interpretation of uh, chapter uh, 9, verse 27 is. But they, they see it as referring to Satan. And Christ is actually the subject of the verb and made the covenant to prevail, but they make Satan the subject of the verb and uh, reconstruct uh, that, that Satan uh, is in cahoots then with the Jews, are they with him? Uh, and uh, he uh, uh, covenants to, to help them with uh, the, their developments in the midst, in the midst of, uh, of the week, and that's how they are handling uh, that language in the midst of the 70th week. Uh, Satan is then thought of, of reneging on his promise, breaking the covenant, which results then in what they dub the, the Great Tribulation. So the last three and a half years of the 70th week, they identify as the Great Tribulation, and which is uh, ended then by the visible returning of Christ. So then, of course, you would have parousia, and then, then, then you do need some other categories up there to take care of what happens from that point on on their view. So the 70th week ends uh, with the parousia and uh, the, that introduces a millennium not of a classic type which involves the church but about the millennium uh, in involving the, the Jewish kingdom on earth which uh, then goes on and to a final judgment and consummation and so on. We won't go into all the details of that now. So those, those are the main varieties we're, we're going to be dealing with, and I trust you can see how uh, important the, the starting point is. If you establish that starting point, uh, you are done with the dispensationist uh, view uh, right away. So let's now then return to that question uh, of the uh, starting point and, and see some of the confirming evidence of the, before the 539 date. We've already seen the Yatsa Davar, huh? At the beginning of your prayer, Daniel, the tree already went forth to do this. And that davar is identified with this vision of, of the 70 uh, weeks. Understand the davar, understand the dimara. And, and then verse 25, from the going forth of that davar, huh, which has already gone forth, there are seven weeks. So uh, there's this all of, of uh, the seven weeks. Now, it all began with Daniel's studying the prophecy of Jeremiah. <coughs> and uh, we therefore want to look at a couple of passages in Jeremiah to see uh, what Daniel was up to and, and what led him to uh, the urgency of this matter. And we're going to be dealing now with the day 605. We uh, worked across the board horizontally with those dates. Uh, now we'll be ver working uh, down vertically here. So the, the year 605 is, is the uh, first date we're concerned with. It's the year that Daniel went in, into exile. And in Jeremiah 25, 11, 12, please turn to that with me. Jeremiah 25, verse 11 and 12. The, the opening verses of uh, Daniel 9 said that, that Daniel had been studying in the prophecies of Jeremiah uh, about the restoration, and there were two passages that were clearly um, in, in view there. Jeremiah 25, verse 11 and 12. Right? Now it's a prophecy about the coming exile. And it shall be, or rather the subject is called our arts, Jeremiah 25, verse 11. All this land 
the Hayatha shall be for desolation and ruin, a couple of different words there. And these nations, and it's actually referring to more than, than, than just the Judah, the, the neighboring uh, little nations too, were all going to be gobbled up here by the, the great Babylonian power. And uh, so uh, these nations are going to be serving the Melek Babel, the king of Babylon, for Shivim Shana, for 70 years. All right, here's another 70. We talked about the, the 70 weeks. We talked about the year 70 AD. But now before the, the 70 weeks began, leading up to them, there are the 70 years of exile that are here prophesied by Jeremiah. So try to keep all of this uh, straight. So there's going to be 70 years and uh, which they will be serving the king of Babylon. Then, verse 12, there will be a change. Then it shall be Kimlot Shavim Shana at the completion of the 70 years. F code, God says, now there's that verb again, pakad, to visit, whether pun sins and punishment are to visit with blessings and, and so on. And uh, here it's again going to be punishment. Uh, it, and so God says, uh, then I will visit upon that Melech Babel who, who took the people into exile and, and upon also his nation. Uh, that's a different word for you. Well, that's certainly in the sense of, of sin. I will visit upon the king of Babylon and upon uh, that nation, says the Lord. Yeah, there it is, at uh, Abu Nam, their, their, their sins, their iniquities. I, I will punish them for what they, they have, have done. Yea, also upon the land of the Chaldeans, and I will turn them into eternal, perpetual, everlasting uh, desolation. And um, I will bring unto that land, uh, or I, I, I will bring upon that land uh, all of my words uh, which uh, I spoke against them, uh, everything which is written here in, in, in this book which uh, Jeremiah prophesied against uh, that nation and so on. All right. So Jeremiah has been prophesying all kinds of judgment on Babylon and at the end of the 70 years God would in inflict that judgment. Okay, now that's the first thing Daniel's been uh, reading about. And now the next one has to do with the year 594. Uh, 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 this has to do uh, with Jeremiah 29. So let's look at Jeremiah 29, verses 10 through 14. The 25th chapter of Jeremiah has made the point that there are the, the 70 years of exile. lead to the destruction of Babylon. Now this passage in Jeremiah 29 gives something else that's going to mark the end of the 70 years and this is going to be the restoration of God's people in, in Jerusalem. So Jeremiah 29 verse 10 Alright, verse 10 for thus uh, says the, the Lord, the idiom is ki lefi melot. Ki lefi melot. Lefi means literally at the mouth of. Melot, infinite construct, the filling. Uh, the together they have the idea again of the completion. It's, it's the equivalent of the term for at the completing of that you found in chapter 25. So uh, at the completion then, with respect to Babylon, of there, again the 70 years. So when the 70 years are up with respect to Babylon, now once again you have that verb pakad, this time not with respect to punishing the sins of Babylon, but with affecting the blessings on the people of God. So at the, the end, when the 70 years of Babylonian exile are over, then I will visit you, and now you have the hippial form from kum, literally I will make to stand, I will fulfill with respect to you all my good word, that is God's, all the things that he had ever promised by way of blessing, that is, 
to restore you unto this place. So there's the second thing that will end uh, the 70 years. Babylon will fall. Jerus the Jews will return to their city. Uh, going on just briefly in verse 11. For I know the thoughts which uh, I entertain concerning you, says the, thought, or says the Lord. Uh, thoughts of Shalom. God's assuring his people that there, there is something beyond the exile judgment uh, in view for them. And uh, he describes that as shalom and, and not the opposite, not evil, uh, namely to give to you an aharit and a tikvah. And that's a nice phrase. So uh, the exile isn't the end of the, the covenant uh, arrangement. Uh, there is the remembrance of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There will be the new covenant and, and, and so on. And even before the new covenant, there will be this typological restoration from uh, Babylon. So the exile is not the end. I have plans for you that involve uh, that you know, all your futures weren't yesterday. There is still an aharit and a tikva. There's a future hope for you uh, beyond the, the exile. And now he seems to move in in these following verses. You'll recognize very much the same sort of thing that we saw over and over again in, in the various prophecies of the new covenant. And so apparently he, he blends rather together here a, a prophecy concerning the restoration from Babylon, the, the typological thing, but then moves a, a, a head to the thought of the anti-typical restoration. Uh, just look at the language. And uh, you will call upon me there, and uh, you will come and you will pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and you will seek me and you will find me, for you will uh, uh, seek me with all your heart. Doesn't that sound like all of these new covenant passages? And uh, I will be found of, of you, says the Lord, and I will turn your captivity. Remember that expression we, we talked about? I will turn your captivity, <coughs> and I will gather you from all of the nations, from all the uh, places where uh, I have scattered you there, says the, the Lord, and, and I will uh, uh, make you to return unto uh, the, the place which uh, I sent you captive from there. So uh, I don't think there's any avoiding the thought that here in Jeremiah 29, that he predicts both at the end of this 70 years uh, exile and, and the, the typological return with uh, the new covenant. But we're interested especially in the first one, which uh, the, the reference to the 70 years demands. Huh? After 70 years, then there will be the restoration. Now, the, the net result is, you see, Daniel's reading this thing. He's studying it. And he's in the year when the 70 years are up and when Babylon has already fallen. Daniel's prayer is dated in this year, the first year of Cyrus, 539 or 538. And that's the, the year that, that Daniel is, is praying. And uh, he's praying so urgently because he's seen now that the, the first sign of the 70 years has already happened. Babylon has fallen. And so now what he's saying is, is look, God, you also said that when the 70 years are over, something else would happen, and that is that the, your people would return. Babylon has fallen. But I'm still in that point where I'm waiting for the other shoe to fall, for, uh, for the, a decree, something to happen for the people to return. So within that one year, both of those things were going to happen. That one was going to fall, and Cyrus was going to issue the decree for them to return, and Daniel's prayer set it right in between them. And, uh, but that's where it is, of course, and, and uh, that, that, of course, is, is uh, the whole concern of the... 70 weeks that must begin to be realized right at that point. Uh, we could also look once again to see the connection between uh, these things and, and the decree of Cyrus at that last page in your Hebrew Bible once again. We looked at it earlier to uh, get an overview of the lawsuit process and, and so forth. Uh, but let's look at it again at uh, Second Chronicles 36. Now the year 587. And uh, Second Chronicles 36 will tie a little bit of this uh, together for us. And we will uh, we could begin at verse 15 and so on, but let's speed along here through maybe verses 20 and 21. And uh, it's speaking about Nebuchadnezzar and how he's destroyed the city and, and temple and so on. And then it says, and, and he took the remnant from the sword into captivity unto Babylon. 
verse 20, by Yegel, and he took into captivity Shuri, the remnant from the sword El Baba unto Babylon, and they were to him and to his sons, the Avadim, as servants. They had to serve him how long? Hmm? How long from 587? They, they had to serve him until the Lokma, uh, until the, the reigning of the Malkut Paras, until Persia took over and until the kingdom of Persia arose. And uh, so, so that happened, of course, 539. So they were going to be in Babylon uh, until Persia took over from the Babylonians. And, and uh, he, he goes on to say then, uh, until the reigning of the kingdom of Persia, in order to fulfill, this was going to happen in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. And uh, so here is what Jeremiah 25 uh, was uh, and 29 was all about. Namely, until the land had made up for its Sabbath all the days that it was lying desolate, uh, it would keep Sabbath in order to fulfill 70 years. And then he goes on in verse 22. And in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, if you had any question about the word Jeremiah 25 and 29 are fulfilled, uh, here it is. In order to fulfill that particular promise, uh, prophecy about the 70 years, uh, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, and he issued a, a coal, a, a proclamation, huh, in all of his kingdom, and also he put it in writing, saying, now here is what Daniel was praying for then, the Babylon has fallen, nothing's happened about the restoration yet, but, but here's the decree he was praying for. It started already in heaven, but it comes to expression now on earth in this actual decree of Cyrus. This is what Cyrus says. Thus says Cyrus, the king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, Yahweh, the God of heaven, has given to me. That's an interesting in itself as to conjecture about Cyrus' spiritual state. Unfortunately, he has other decrees where he says the same thing about other gods who have done the same for him. And, with their lands, and so we can't take a too full value here, this uh, confession of, of the true Lord, but I mean, he at least puts it this way, has given to me, and he has charged me, here's that verb pakat again with a slightly different meaning, he has commissioned me in order to build for him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah, whoever there is therefore among his people, may the Lord uh, his God be with him, and, and let him go up. So, uh, uh, here then, uh, the second final 36 points to 539 as that which ends the period which uh, Jeremiah referred to as the, as the 70 uh, years. And those 70 years then uh, in this same context are described as a time when the land would be enjoying its Sabbath. Now that same theme is was back in that Leviticus 26 passage that we looked at earlier about the Todah prayer. There too, it spoke about the time of the exile, the 70 years, as a, as a, a Sabbath experience for the land. Uh, the, 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 while the Jews were in the land, they didn't fulfill the obligation to let the land lie fallow every seven years. So the poor land was sweating it out and didn't get a Sabbath break. But now that the, the people are removed from the land, uh, every year from now on is going to be a Sabbath year for the land. You don't have to wait for the sabbatical year. I, the, the thought is that it, that seven years get compressed into one. Every one year is, is a sabbatical period when the, the, the land is uh, enjoying its Sabbath in order to make up for the full number. And you see what that means. Uh, there's going to be a 70 years exile. Every year equals seven years. And so the 70 years equals 490 years. In other words, the period leading up to the prophecy of the 70 weeks involves a 490 year period symbolically a, a Sabbath structure and uh, that is precisely the same thing that's being picked up again uh, here in the prophecy of the 70 weeks, uh, something that involves 490 years and the, the Sabbath interpretation of the 70 years of, of exile, the explicit Sabbatarian explanation of, of that tells you then that that's of course what you should be looking for 
in the corresponding uh, prophecy of the 490 years and seventy. It is sabbatical symbolism, and more precisely, of course, it is jubilee symbolism as, as the breaking up, especially of the first section into a, a unit of one jubilee uh, would uh, indicate. But uh, all of the accumulating evidence then keeps focusing that this is what, what it's all about. There's no getting away from it. That, that's the start. That ends the one 70-year exile prophecy and launches uh, this uh, new thing. Lord, you have you have fulfilled the, the, the destruction of Babylon, but uh, if you're going to not break your word, it's urgent that you issue the decree to restore your people as Jeremiah had <coughs> prophesied. So we'll take it from there, I guess, tomorrow.